friends, will you pray with me? Oh, Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is a story about my friend, Allison. Now, for me, Allison is a friend in the category that I describe as could have all of my kidneys. <laughs> We've known each other for over half our lives, and she's a help you move, pick you up at the airport, can help herself to my non-essential organs kind of friend. Now, Allison used to get terrible migraines, paralyzingly painful, stuck lying in the dark, cold compresses over her eyes, bad migraines. Nothing helped. Medicine, diet, exercise, nothing. They would just come at will and take her out. And then one day, she was at a campus ministry staff meeting and she got a migraine. And because she was at a campus ministry staff meeting, the thing she did was ask for prayer for healing. And the people prayed. And it worked. Hand to God, she was healed. The migraine has passed, and the migraines did not come back. And for a while, all was well. And she and we told a story of a good and faithful God who showed up in prayer and community and was the powerful rescuer that we know God to be from the stories we read in the Bible, from the life of my friend. And for a while, all was well, until her migraines came back. And that was devastating. Devastating physically because once again she was waylaid by terrible pain. And devastating emotionally and theologically, because how do you tell a story about a miracle that doesn't stick? What do you believe about a God who heals in faithful community and then stops doing it? What do you do when healing isn't the end of suffering? What we did was silent prayer. We tried to see if we could hear that still, small voice of God. If we could get some clarity on where God was at work and how we should be faithfully responding. And what we heard was this story. The bleeding woman. The woman with faith that if she could just touch the hem of his garment, she would be made whole. And she did. And she was. And that wasn't the end of the story. One of the things that scholars like to talk about when they talk about this story is how the woman would have been unclean all the time. Not sinful, but unclean all the time. Untouchable all the time. They pull out the 15th chapter of Leviticus, the system of laws for ritual purity, and they talk about how any woman on her period was unclean for a whole week, and anyone who touched her was unclean for a whole day. And the uncleanliness extended not just to her or anyone she touched, but even to her bed and things she sat on, so that if someone happened to touch something a woman on her period had sat on earlier, they too would become unclean until that evening. And the woman in our story, she never stopped bleeding. And so she would have been unclean all the time. Unable to hold hands or give a hug or go over to a friend's house for dinner. She shouldn't have even been in that crowd because of how likely it was that she'd brush up against someone and make them unclean too. Imagine the isolation, the suffering, both the discomfort of the experience itself and the experience of being fundamentally uncomfortable. No one could comfort you without joining in your uncleanliness. 
isolation at every turn. For 12 years, stuck in a system that says you are not to be touched. And then you hear of a rabbi who does miracles, who heals leprosy with his touch, cures paralysis with his voice, a man who can rebuke the wind. You hear this rabbi eats with the rejected, and you think maybe, maybe if he heals people like that, if he eats with people like them, maybe he could heal me too. Maybe he could touch me too. So you ask some questions, and you follow his trail, and one day you find him in Capernaum surrounded by people en route to heal a sick child, and you take one last deep breath, and you make your way into the crowd, doing your best not to touch anyone, but knowing that every bump and brush spreads your suffering to others. You can see him, his brown hair, his calloused hands, his robe, and you know, you know that if you can just catch hold of his robe, this man with the power to cast out demons can make you whole. And you reach out, and you stretch with all you have, and yes, you catch it. And you feel the power of this rabbi who eats with the rejected. You feel the change. You know you are no longer bleeding. And he knows it too. He turns around and asks, who touched my clothes? And the crowd freezes, and you collapse, terrified that this change in you will be undone, that this man will rebuke you like he rebukes the wind, and all will be for nothing, untouchable again. But he looks into your eyes. With love and compassion you haven't seen in 12 years and says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. And you do, and you're healed, and you can hug your mom, and you can sit with your sisters, and you can start to dream about what your life will be like now, now that you're healed and whole. And then a month goes by and you bleed again, because of course you bleed again. And it all comes pouring back, and for a week, once again, you are untouchable. And it's devastating. Because what do you do when healing isn't the end of suffering, when it's not the end of the story? We found so much hope in that story. Because the woman was healed by God and in community. And healing wasn't the end of her suffering. Because it's a story where both things can be true. Because that is what life is like. That's what Allison's migraines were like. That's what being a human is like. Suffering is part of being human. Separate from any system, any unjust practice, any wall we build or protection we rally, we're going to suffer. It's part of being alive. The woman in our story was stuck in a system that added isolation to the suffering. And in doing so, made suffering worse. By making it a metric for belonging making her suffering, which again was not sinfulness, but just a part of being alive. Her suffering was a line of demarcation for whether or not she could dwell in community. Jesus said no to this. Jesus said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed. Jesus said, you are family, and your well-being is bound up with my well-being. Your suffering is my suffering, and to the extent that I can help, take my power for your healing. 
Jesus neither destroys the cleanliness codes from Leviticus nor removes the woman's womb. He knows that suffering will continue because suffering is a part of being alive. What he does do is make a way clear for her suffering to happen in community again. For her to be held, touched, comforted by those who lived alongside and loved her. For her suffering to no longer be a source of shame, but for it to be shared. And for her to have the chance to take a share in holding the suffering of someone else. After we prayed, Allison still had migraines. Less often, but she still got them. But she started telling us about them. And we started asking about them. And when we could, we moved days around so she could rest when she needed to. And we tried to be people who brought her cold compresses. We tried to be a community that held each other's suffering. I started the sermon by saying she was the kind of friend who can have all of my kidneys. And I say that because I know that if that were ever the situation, as much as I would offer her mine, she'd be racing to give me hers. Because healing isn't the end of suffering. But it can be a way into community. A way into lives where suffering is shared where God shows up and where it turns out to be a story worth telling after.